Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, October 2nd, 2024. Let's get into it. So I wanted to get to the story that was much more important than the vice presidential debate. <laughs> we knew that the, uh, uh, the hosts were not going to treat either candidate friendly. And no, I did not watch it uh, anyway, because I, I, I already know who I'm voting for anyway which is kind of sad. You'd think maybe they, something might change my mind. I don't think so at this point. You know how I feel. But uh, we've forgotten about Hurricane Helene, and I wanted to start the video off with everything I could find about it. But what was shocking to me was when I went out on the Internet, because uh, I was trying to pull down like photographs of what the devastation looks like. That's, that's the key. I didn't want... You know, all of, there's plenty of video about the hurricane coming in and the track of the hurricane and all of that. But there's all the video has been scrubbed about what's going on in, in East Tennessee and, and uh, East North Carolina. And uh, luckily, I found some video at AccuWeather and I found a video on uh, on X. Let's watch the first video now. Where's our government right now? Because, guys, that's North Carolina over there. I'm in Tennessee, and I just read and saw a video where they said that uh, people and their uh, whole beings were laying all over the ground, and the smell was, like, horrific, and nobody can get in there. Nobody's going over there. What is going on? Why isn't the government helping? This is, this is worse than anybody even expected or even knows because none of the news channels are are even reporting on this except for like TikTok. That's it. What is going on? These people need help. They need help over North Carolina. They need the government to come in with dang the military. What is going on? Why aren't they helping? There is literally a stink happening because there's so many uh beings laying everywhere. Go oh, I I'm just so infuriated right now and angry you guys. Where's the government? I mean, if the government really wanted to help, dude, there would be helicopters and, and you know, military just everywhere. There's none. There's none. What is going on? Okay, so what she's saying is that there's so many dead bodies that the smell is horrendous. And I, I mean, I can't believe uh, that our federal government cares, well, the Democrats, <laughs> let's be honest here. They don't give a shit about the American citizens. I, but I tell you what, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable that the callous nature of, of our government, these people are suffering, man. And uh, they're, they're, I, I'm going to get you to the positive part of the story, but I wanted to continue with the devastation at the beginning of the video here, because I know how people are. You're going to watch the first two minutes of the video <laughs> and, and then switch channels. So let's watch everything I could find. Boy, this is heavily edited because they kept throwing commercials up into it. And, you know, and anyway, I did the best I could to show you what I what I could find. This is it. Here in Burnsville, North Carolina, one of the hardest hit communities from the floodwaters left over from Hurricane Helene. The community is bonded together. But what do you do when the communications have been cut off and you have barely any touch with the outside world? This community is bonded together, making signs and getting a little bit of Wi-Fi out there so residents can communicate with their loved ones and attempt to find those still missing. Burnsville is a quiet town tucked deep in the Appalachian Mountains. As Hurricane Helene roared on shore, this town is suddenly too quiet as communications have been cut off and residents impatiently waiting for some sort of information on when more help will arrive and the fate of their loved ones. A constant buzzing of helicopters rescuing still stranded residents from their mountain homes as the roadways have been completely washed out and unable to get to supplies. Hotel owner Amanda Keith set up an area of notes and a board filled with wants and needs while others check in to let everyone know that they are safe. People have been leaving messages for each other, um, prayer requests, and uh, just notes, things, helpful things that might help people find people or help find resources. Or We came to Burnsville because it's, it's an incredibly supportive community. Um, people are really good-hearted. So people are just out here helping each other as they can. 
This community may not look like it once was for years to come, but it is a strong one. And a lot of the community members tell me that they are confident that they will bounce back and they will rebuild in due time. For AccuWeather, I'm Aaron Rigsby. All right, so that's the video of what I could find. Now, the good news is is that Trump is on the ground in uh, Georgia because Georgia also got hit uh, nowhere near as bad as what the devastation is in Tennessee and North Carolina. And uh, he's brought in some truckloads of uh, supplies and uh, evidently got on the phone with Elon Musk. And uh, so they're providing, uh, because the communications are all down, as you saw in the videos, uh, there's no, I mean, look, they were using blackboards, man. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, I can't believe that, that our federal government just doesn't care about the American citizens. And, like, we can give all the money in the world to Ukraine and Israel, but, and of course, Israel runs the government. And um, so, but uh, also Elon Musk is providing Starlink terminals uh, to to everybody that he can. They're, they're rushing them in there. The problem is getting it to the people. Because unless you got a helicopter, uh, you can't, uh, or you got a plane that you can airdrop it in. Uh, there's just no way to get it there. But I did want to refresh your memory. I mean, remember back to East Palestine. You know, we've seen how the Biden administration doesn't care about Americans, and that was the first example. Remember Pete Buttigieg, <laughs> or Gay Pete, as uh, Dave Rubin likes to call him, Gay Pete. I, I don't even think he visited East Palestine after that uh, a horrible, horrible uh, train accident dumped all those chemicals into their water and destroyed the town. Uh, you know, the federal government just... And then uh, the other thing I wanted you to remember about was uh, Maui. Uh, remember Maui when, when everybody burned? I mean, burning to death is one of the most horrible deaths you can ever imagine. And uh, Biden, I think he visited about two weeks later and everybody was booing him and, and insulting him and saying, yeah, yeah you, you show up now and blah, 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 blah. And uh, but the thing is, it doesn't get make sense to me now. OK, let's 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 give him a fair chance, because California just passed a law that you don't have to show ID to vote, which means that I can literally travel from Florida to California and walk in and uh, say, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm John Smith. I live in uh, San Antonio, and uh, I'm going to vote, and I can vote. So that's that's how. Can, but that's how they uh, they're rigging the election, and uh, and it's just blatantly right in your face. That's, but that's who Democrats are. Uh, now I don't know what goes on in Hawaii. So maybe, you know, Hawaii cheats the same way that California does, and that's why they keep going Democrat. But Hawaii, after what took place in Maui, when your people burned to death. I mean, if you do have a somewhat fair election and you still vote Democrat, well, hell, Hawaii, I got no sympathy for you. You get what you deserve. You know, you get your own comeuppance. Um, the, uh, the other huge story, I covered this in, in yes, or, or the September 30th video, was that uh, I told you that, the, um, that there was a strike looming of the dock, work, dock workers. And so now let me give you the details on that. So we've got 45,000... International Longshoremen Association, the ILA, uh, strike workers that have gone on strike on the East and Gulf Coasts. Uh, now that's costing uh, the country five billion per day. Now the first week, you're probably not going to feel the impact of that uh, per se, other than you know the lost. Uh, well, you're going to see inflation starting to rise, but in minuscule amounts. The second week, uh, a lot of those goods. Uh, are not going to be showing up on the shelves. Your shelves are going to start going bare. Uh, the third week, uh, businesses uh, that, that are not making any money, 
uh, you know, we're going to start seeing, you know, third, fourth, fifth week that a lot of businesses are going to go out of business. Uh, your fuel prices, a lot of fuel prices are going to go sky high. Uh, your inflation is going to go up. I mean, this is a big damn deal. And you saw in the September 30th video that the, what is it called, the Commerce Secretary? She didn't even know that there was going to be a strike. <laughs> she, did you see that video? She goes, well, I, you know, I haven't really paid much attention to it. I guess there's going to be a strike. I mean, your government is so out of tune with what's going on. I mean, they, they live in their own little elite bubble. This reminds me of Marie Antoinette. Wasn't it her that said, let them eat cake? I mean, and then they brought the guillotine out. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, that's who the Democrats are. Uh, we got another huge event going on that nobody's reporting on, and that is uh, Samsung and GE are cutting thousands of jobs. Uh, GE is, is taking place, it's in Kansas, I think it's the Kansas plant, and they're going to be cutting a bunch of jobs there in uh, November, uh, and they say it's to retool for electric cars. Now, if that's true, they're dumber than a bag of stones, but, you know, as somebody pointed out, why can't they just pay the employees, you know, if they're, if they're really going to retool the factory and bring them back in, why, why lay them off? So, I mean, so a lot of people are thinking GE is going to go out of business. But, of course, then the government's going to try to bail them out again. But I'm going to say bail them out with what? We're giving everything we got to Ukraine and, and Israel. Which, on that note, I did want to point out something that I think is a good thing. You know, as we give all of these weapons to, to uh, Ukraine and, and Israel, uh, that means that our military has a lot less so if our government, which I think we've already turned the, the FBI and the CIA inward on the American citizens, you know, we've still got people locked up from January 6th. Uh, but, you know, the more the military is depleted, because they're obviously following just the orders of the Democrats at this point. There's no, there's no government, there's no constitutional government running the country anymore. We know that. Biden's a meat puppet and Kamala's just a, a vacuous sack. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, so you know, neither one of them are running anything. And then you got Blinken, who's really just a freaking Israeli agent in, in the government. Uh, and of course, uh, and there's a lot of people that are owned by the Chinese, like Walsh. Uh, he's been to China 30 times, if you didn't know that. Uh, but anyway, so uh, that's, that's another huge story. Um, I did get some more details on what took place uh, on the day that, that brought about the Is uh, Iranian strike. On uh, on Israel, like I, I'm sure you've you're brought up to date on that. I don't need to cover that, but it was uh, and I don't think I, I I don't remember if I covered this, but it was 80 2,000 pound bombs or bunker busting bombs that Israel dropped, uh, taking down six apartment buildings to get down to the the bunker below them, uh, where um, the Hezbollah leader. Gosh dang it, I. I can't remember all the names and everything. I, I'm not Alexander from the Duran. I mean, that guy's got a photographic memory. Um, but I did want to, to point that out to you. And so, but a little detail you probably didn't know is that that section of Beirut is very, very densely populated. I mean, in a small area, there's like 100,000 people that live there. So we haven't got the numbers on how many civilians that Israel had. Well, they said it's 100,000 people just lived in that small area. Okay. So how many people did they kill with, I mean, have you ever seen a 2,000-pound bomb go off? It's devastating. It looks like a nuclear explosion. And there were 80 of them dropped? This is the yield ratio of, of a nuclear bomb. So literally Israel dropped a nuclear bomb on, the, on, a, on a very populous place in, in, in downtown Beirut. There's a lot of people don't understand these things. Why do you think? Everybody, or Iran, everybody got so pissed off. Uh, so, but anyway, let's let's get to what's taking place in Lebanon right now. Um, I found this on RT, and by the way, this is the Red Cross. They're doing a story on the Red Cross, okay? But I couldn't find any other information, on, especially on mainstream media in the, in the United States. Let's watch that video. Earlier, we spoke with an advisor to the international community of the Red Cross in Lebanon. He said the total number of displaced people is currently unclear. As of the escalation of conflict, along with all the humanitarian consequences and the dire humanitarian situation that has caused, all of this has been extremely concerning for the international community of the Red Cross. 
especially that this displacement comes at a time where the Lebanese population has been facing multiple complex crises back to back. Currently, we are seeing an unprecedented amount of internal displacement in Lebanese history as described by the Lebanese Prime Minister. The number of displaced has reached around 1 million uh, internally displaced people. These people are struggling to find shelter, to have access to water, to food, and even to essential health care that is needed in such situations. Up till now, we are talking about a total death toll of 1,600 people, at least, of which 1,000 were dead in the, ten, in the, in the last 10 days. In addition to 8,000 uh, uh, people injured, and we are talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of people, again, that were displaced in the recent days. Uh, Lebanon has, uh, internal, has around 1 million of internally displaced people. These are mainly coming from southern Lebanon, from Beka, and from the southern suburb of Beirut. Out of these, uh, almost 1 million, uh, because again, when you try to calculate or to count the number of internally displaced people, it's a bit of a complex uh, procedure because not all of the people go directly to emergency shelters. Many of these are staying with their families, others are staying with friends, some are trying to rent uh, uh, places to stay, and there are also plenty of people still are not, uh, not able to uh, find a shelter. As per the latest numbers that were shared by the Disaster Risk Management uh, Unit, the operations room that's working under the Prime Minister's office, we are talking about 148,000 uh, IDPs who have already been uh, uh, who have already moved into emergency shelters. So far, we have 808 active uh, emergency shelters. However, this number, which accounts almost for 28 or 29,000 families, is just a small uh, 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 chunk of the whole number of uh, internally displaced people. Because, as I mentioned earlier, not all of them are moving into the uh, emergency shelters. Uh, in addition to this, a lot of people have also been displaced outside the country. All right, so they're talking in that video about, you know, million people. Where are they going to go? I guess Europe, maybe? I mean, is Europe ready to take on a million a Lebanese? Uh, I mean, the ones with money, they're going to fly probably to the United States or other places. I mean, they, I would welcome them over the illegal aliens that the Democrats, all the criminals that they're bringing across the border and the child trafficking and the drug cartels and the fentanyl that the Democrats want. I, I would welcome Lebanese if they want to come to the United States. But um, anyway, I mean, if, if, if we want illegal immigration, let's, let's give those people a lift. You know, I, uh, of course, I'm not sure how... <laughs> They might be terrorists, too, because I imagine they hate the United States now because a lot of them, uh, they've been under the U.S. bombs. So maybe that is not a good idea I, now that I think about it. Uh, let's get to, um, this is another huge story. Uh, Vol 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 Oldegar, and I, I tell you, it's spelled with a V and a U. I've seen it both ways. I, I don't know about these Russian names, but it has fallen. I'll put the image up above. Uh, and uh, a lot of people don't understand, but there's a little bit of details around that. Now, the Russians, what they did, rather than form a cauldron, they actually surrounded it. And they cut off the, uh, the roads of supply. And because you, uh, Zelensky was over here in the United States, he told uh, um, his forces remain in Ugladar, even though they wanted to uh, retreat or get, you know, get, fall back to a more defensible uh, location. Uh, but he wouldn't let them, and so they got trapped in there. And uh, and so the commander, he he saw the writing on the wall, and you know, understand how supplies work. You've only got so many days of food. You only got so many days of water. You only got so many days of ammo. All right. So there were obviously no. There's no party coming. This was the Alamo. <laughs> Think of the Alamo. Nobody was coming to the rescue. All right. You know. And, and, and so what are they going to do, fight to the last Ukrainian? No, he, he went ahead and I guess he, he surrendered. And, uh, and by the way, the, and to tell you, now this guy fought hard, man. Think of all the battles he won at Ugladar. The Russians tried to take that town five times. I mean, and he, he beat them every single time. And what is his reward? He's been decommissioned. He's now branded a, like a traitor. Just because he, he surrendered his men because he didn't want to see him die. Now, I don't know how those men are going to get treated. The Russians were treating Ukrainian prisoners very good at the beginning of the war. 
But things changed, you know, with the curse invasion and a lot of that terrorist act, remember, in the, in the theater there in Moscow? I mean, I, so I don't know. I mean, surrender, I hope, I hope the Russians, I haven't heard any reports of Russians. They might beat them up a little bit, but I haven't heard of them like, you know, mass killing prisoners or anything like that. So I think they're going to be okay. And I think it was the right decision. So, and by the way, I, this was a shocking piece of information was that the New York Times actually reported on this story. There was actually some real news in that rag of a newspaper called the New York Times. I was absolutely shocked. I was like, no, no way. The New York Times can't report on Ugaldar. I So yeah, they actually reported on it. Uh, so then uh, I wanted to get into a, a video. This is uh, Julian Assange. Uh, by the way, I can't believe, I thought, I thought his mind would just be mush. And it is mush to a certain degree. I mean, but he seems to be recovering, thank God. And, uh, you know, and so he, he did an interview. And I've got the video. And uh, let's just watch him in his own words. But before we get that on, uh, I don't know which portion of the video that I got. But he says, and by the way, a lot of people still think Mike, Mike Pompeo is a good dude. That guy was, he's CIA, he's deep state to the core. I mean, Trump made some bad, bad decisions in his personnel in the first administration. He also made bad, bad decisions in Fauci and the jab and, and Operation Warp Speed and all that crap. Trump, I don't understand, but you understand, I mean, I, give, I defend him in one way, and that is he was a businessman. He came into a, a swamp, and he had no idea how deep the swamp ran. He was probably listening to some rhinos, and they were telling him, yeah, you need to put this guy here, William Barr. So what Julian Assange said is that William Barr and, uh, and Mike Pompeo tortured him for years. In fact, Mike Pompeo put a death warrant out on him. Uh, luckily, they, they didn't get him. But anyway, if I got the video, let's watch it. By March 2017, WikiLeaks had exposed the CIA's infiltration of French political parties. It's spying on French and German leaders. It's spying on the European Central Bank, European Economic <laughs> Ministries, and its standing orders to spy on French industry as a whole. We revealed the CIA's vast production of malware and viruses, its subversion of supply chains, its subversion of antivirus software, cars, smart TVs, and iPhones. CIA Director Pompeo launched a campaign of retribution. It is now a matter of public record that under Pompeo's explicit direction, the CIA drew up plans to kidnap and to assassinate me within the Ecuadorian Embassy in London and authorized going after my European colleagues, subjecting us to theft, hacking attacks, and the planting of false information. My wife and my infant son were also targeted. A CIA asset was permanently assigned to track my wife, and instructions were given to obtain DNA from my six-month-old son's nappy. This is the testimony of more than 30 current and former US intelligence officials speaking to the US press, which has been additionally corroborated by records seized in a prosecution brought against some of the CIA agents involved. The CIA's targeting of myself, my family, and my associates through aggressive extrajudicial and extraterritorial means provides a rare insight into how powerful intelligence organizations engage in transnational repression. All right, so that's Julian Assange. I, I, I want to go back because uh, I found a video on, you know, my most hated man, the, the, the international war criminal, uh, that little bastard Fauci. Okay, so enough on Fauci. I can't stand that little bastard. Uh, we're going to get to, uh, the, the, we're going to continue with the, um, the conflict in, in the Middle East uh, briefly. I, you know, I don't want to talk about it too much, but there was a video posted. I, I'm not going to show it, but the uh, Iranian president, he came out and he, we were wondering why, well, I, I got multiple theories on why Iran's been quiet for the last three months or so. Uh, the first is, is that I think they were waiting until Russia could beef up their, um, their defenses. Because I'm pretty sure Russians given them a lot of air defenses, those S-400s. 
Uh, and so, and it takes a lot of work to get those set up and running and, and people trained up and probably Russian soldiers are still there manning a lot of those, uh, those uh, S-400s and, you know, because I'm sure they're training the Iranians to take over because they want to get the hell out of there <laughs> just as fast as they can. And so that's why Iran was waiting. That's the first reason they were waiting. But the Iranian president came out and he said, he said, well, the United States told me that if we didn't, you know, uh, launch on Iran, that they were going to lift the sanctions and, uh, and that they are also going to call for a ceasefire in, uh, in you know, in Gaza. U.S. lies about everything, man, especially the Democrats. <laughs> Would you believe anything that came out of an FBI agent's mouth or the United States government at this point? Hell, would you believe your Democrat neighbor on anything that they say? I mean, this guy, the naivety is beyond belief, isn't it? I, I would, if a Democrat told me the sky was blue, I'd say, you're lying. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's the way I feel about it, you know. I can't believe this guy was dumb enough to believe the U.S. government. Now, maybe he was trying to CYA, but he made himself look incredibly stupid. In fact, he looked so stupid that the Supreme Commander overruled him this time because he didn't, still didn't want to launch on, on Iran. And the Supreme Commander said, no, we're done. And that's why they held up in my previous video, I showed you they held that emergency meeting in Russia because Iran, I didn't know at the time why they were having the emergency meeting. I did speculate that probably Iran called them up and said, we're launching, baby, we're going to war. And turns out I was correct. Hate it when I'm right, huh? I, I, you know that cybersecurity guy? You're right about everything, aren't you? <laughs> so, so anyway, we've got some, uh, some numbers on that. But before we get started, I... Iran and the U.S. government claimed that nothing got through. There's nothing to see here. Everything's fine. The Iron Dome worked 100%. Let's watch two quick videos uh, that dispute that theory. So that was just two things. I mean, there's a lot more that I could have shown you. I mean, you know, I, I, they're all over uh, YouTube and Rumble and uh, X, you know. But anyway, did that look like nothing got through? I mean, I don't know. You tell me. I mean, maybe that was just debris falling down onto the ground. I, you know, that's it's up to you. You believe what you want. Uh, now, the numbers that everybody keeps giving was the government said 189 or something like that. Some people said 200. Uh, but I believe Pepe Escobar. He said it was 400. So I'm 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 giving you the 400 number. I think it was 400 missiles that uh, Iran launched at uh, at uh, um, at Israel, and I'm not sure how many Iskanders. I want to say between four and eight eight Iskanders uh, were launched, and they all went through. And uh, from what I understand, there's severe damage to that air base. Uh, I'll put the name up above the of the air base that was hit. It's, I think it's the largest air base in Israel. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was right about that. So now we're going to, we're just going to finish off. I, I'm trying to think, did I miss any videos or hear anything? No, we're going to finish off with two videos. This is Douglas McGregor, uh, and he's talking about wake up, but I did want to do a reading of a tweet of his, and we're going to do that in just a second. So let's do that now before, before we get into the last two videos. So the first one is, and I'll show you this picture, because uh, the war is continuing. This was two, seven hours ago. Residents in Beirut report Israeli strikes against at least four high-rise residential buildings in the Dahia suburb to the south. And I'll, I'll put that picture up for you. Um, this is DD Geopolitics, and we'll put this up for you. The Command and Control Center for Operation True Promise 2, featuring Brigadier General Amir Ali Hazadeh, 
commander of the IRGC Aerospace Force alongside Major General Mohammed Baghari, chief of staff of the Iranian Armed Forces. And look at him. It's like a bro. <laughs> it's like a bro get together. I bet this is this is what it looked like in that bunker when Obama uh, was was taking out. Uh, uh, what was it? Osama bin Laden. Laden. Remember when they were sitting down there in the bunker? This is what it looks like. So anyway, that, I thought that was cute. Uh, this is DD Geopolitics again. Uh, Russian, Russia plans to open embassies in Niger, Sierra Leone, and South Sudan, the Russian foreign ministry has reported. So you see how the, the Russians are expanding everything parallel. Um, they're pretty much taking over Africa because we are so busy with everything Ukraine, giving them every penny we got, you know, what, 200, 300 billion dollars now, and giving Israel all the things we got, and keeping our our fleet bogged down in the Red Sea, which if the hypersonic missiles, those carriers are sitting ducks out there. But I wanted to get into Doug McGregor's because I thought this was a great um, post by him. Given that Israel's decision to invade Lebanon marks the beginning of a regional war, Americans should remember that the United States has no mutual defense treaty with Israel. America's support for Israel defense has always been unilaterally defined by successive presidents without the ratification of a formal treaty. Understand, we have no treaty with Israel. I know Israel rules the U.S. government. I understand that, okay? And, and that's why we do everything to, to save Israel. I mean, Blinken's a damn Israeli uh, spy or agent or Israeli citizen. Um, so, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, our whole government just serves Israel. Uh, but uh, but if, it, if, if, if the stuff hit the fan here in the United States... Uh, Israel's not going to help us out. Do you see any Israelis in, in North Carolina or any Israelis in uh, uh, our, um, Tennessee helping out with the, uh, the efforts to help those people? Oh, hell no. Uh, this approach parallels Roosevelt's unilateral alliance with the British Empire and the Soviet Union prior to World War II. What he's implying there is that we're going to walk ourselves right into World War III just to help a tiny little nation of, what, six million people? that has is, is behaved like a badger in the Middle East, blowing up everything in sight? I mean, anyway, the ramification of such an alliance is not only simply support for the defense of Israel, but the acceptance of Israel's growing number of enemies as our own. The entire world hates Israel right now. I showed you in the last video that everybody walked out of Netan or Netanyahu's speech at the UN, Okay. You don't just walk out on somebody like that unless the, you, there's some animosity there. And because we're doing everything we can to support Israel, that animosity blows back on us. And we're letting in 30 million illegal aliens. Do you think that uh, some of those countries are not pumping in some terrorist groups in the United States? I mean, I, this whole shit's going to blow up, man. In the view of the likely widening of the regional war to most of the Islamic world, Americans should prepare for attacks against the U.S. on Americans' own soil as well as our bases throughout the world. So I did want to do that reading. Uh, okay, I guess we could finish up right there. So the first video, this is uh, Doug McGregor saying to wake up. Uh, and then we're going to follow that back to back. Because what we have is, um, well, hell, let's just watch that now. People need to wake up. Americans need to put down the beer, get up off the couch, and pay attention to what's happening because they could wake up to regional wars that combined begin to look awfully global. I've been really worried about the sort of wag the dog, you know, as we head into this election. And I know it's, it almost sounds like a conspiracy theory at this point, but that we would try, you know, try to rally the American people around a common enemy, whether it's through a false flag or some other strategy, this combination over the past 24 hours of this U.S. and U.K. propaganda telling us that Iran and Russia teaming up to bring us, you know, to create a, a force of nuclear weapons. So I keep looking for these signs of the wag the dog moment. And every morning I'm sort of surprised by the new headlines. And I see today the U.K. and U.S. warning about a, an alliance to build, a, you know, a Iranian nuclear weapons and with Russia and now we need to fear that. Um, what's well, the truth here? You, you say wag the dog, and I think it's interesting that if you listen to Zelensky and Netanyahu, they both have a similar objective. Both of them want desperately to drag the United States into war on their behalf. 
That's quite right. clear. So we're already the dog being wagged at this point. The question <laughs> is, are, are we going to be wagged and dragged right over the finish line, which means open war with Russia, Iran, and potentially China, and who knows el who else in the in the Middle East? I mean, the, the entire region is up in arms right now against Israel. Th that's another question. Now, to get back real quick to something else you mentioned, this missile the Houthis launched, remember it flew 1,300 miles, and we estimate about 12 minutes. A hypersonic, that, yes. That sounds hypersonic to me. That may have flown at, say, 4,500 or 4,900 uh, miles per hour. Anything over 4,500 miles per hour is hypersonic. And it can go all the way up to 7,600 7, miles per hour, which we don't see very often. All right, so that was the Douglas McGregor video. And I wanted to finish off with this. Now, if you stayed to the bitter end, you're going to be rewarded. Because, uh, you know, a lot of Democrats have no common sense or no sense of the world around them whatsoever. And they never question, why, why is Bill Clinton rich beyond the wildest dreams? Why is Nancy Pelosi worth $300 million or whatever it is? Why is uh, Barack Obama living in a mansion at Martha's Vineyard <laughs> when, he, when he was only making between one hundred to 200000 a year as president? Because they're grifters, man. That's what they do. And the Democrats, they just go right along with it. They think, well, you know, it's okay. He just stole, you know, $100 million. You know, that's okay because that's why we elected him, so that he could steal $100 million. But this is Obama's own brother talking about his brother, Obama. Peace out. Stay free. Did he want the money? Because he's a rich man now. What, uh, some estimates, quarter of a billion, some $70 million. Was it the money Barack Obama, your brother, wanted? Or was he being blackmailed into supporting Hillary Clinton's agenda? No, I think he just had to play around. Uh, he had to play along in order to, you know, to uh, to, to be where, where he was. To be the president of the USA, he had to have the backing of certain people like the Clintons. And they're the ones who are, you know, really controlling everything out there. And whoever else was there, I don't know, maybe the Soros people, whoever the money people, whoever is running Washington, D.C., who he was in uh, in cahoots with. And they may be the ones. To, or it could have been even him himself. But I don't think, well, when I met him, Barack was a really humble, a really nice person. Uh, he was an affable guy. And uh, he was, uh, you know, had a lot of humility. Uh, but when he became the president, he became powerful and got in uh, involved with all those. Things. He was in the corridors of power, and and uh, he, had, I feel that, I think he had to act a certain way. Otherwise, what would have happened if he had said no? I mean, Trump has said, said Trump you... said no. Well, he said yes in the end, but he's out when out of power. Trump does say he's opposed to the deep state and has attracted the support of RFK Jr. and Tulsi Gabbard and others who don't want eternal war. If your brother had said no to all these people, uh, the massive lobbyists from foundations and uh, the yeah. military-industrial complex, what would have happened to your brother? What? Yeah, he, could have, he would have lost his support. I think he would, he, he would have lost his uh, support. And he would not uh, be what he is today. I don't think so, because those people are the ones who propped him up. So you had to play into them. You had to play to them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that's why I like President Trump, because he does things his own way. You know, he went out to South Korea, North Korea and met uh, the, the the leader there. And that was also, that's what he could have done. He could have done that for Muammar Gaddafi. Same thing. You know, just uh, being bold. But I think he's just, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a simp.